We'll start with the hymn of Pascha the Christos Anesti. Christos Anesti ek nekron thanato thanato en patisas ketisen tismni Liberator of captives, defender of the poor, physician of the sick, and champion of kings, O trophy bearer, great martyr George, intercede with Christ our God, that our souls be saved. Before the dawn, Mary and the women came and found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They heard the angelic voice, Why do you seek among the dead as a man, the one who is everlasting light? Behold the clothes in the grave. Go and proclaim to the world the Lord is risen. He has slain death, as he is the Son of God, saving the race of men. Having beheld the resurrection of Christ, let us worship the Holy Lord Jesus, the only Sonless One. We venerate your cross, O Christ, and your holy resurrection. We praise and glorify for you are our God, and we know none other besides you. We call on your name. Come, all you faithful, let us venerate Christ's holy resurrection. For behold, through the cross is joy come into all the world. Let us ever bless the Lord, praising his resurrection. By enduring the cross for us, he has destroyed death by death. Please be seated. Christos Anesti. Christ is risen. So we are now in our eighth session uh, of the adult education program as we continue studying the liturgy. Last month, we talked about really the, one of the central parts of the liturgy, which is the anaphora. The anaphora being the long prayer of the offering. Uh, and what are we offering? We're offering the bread and the wine to God as a sacrifice on our behalf so that God can transform it into his uh, body and blood. During the Anaphora, we pray for the Holy Spirit to come down on the gifts and to transform them. And by participating properly in the mysteries, we also are transformed. The Anaphora, the offering, is an offering of thanksgiving. That was one of the things in the prayer we see continually. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. It's one of the main themes is thanksgiving. And so our offering that we offer to God, besides the bread and the wine, is our thanks. We, in the Anaphora, we remember everything that God has done for us. Everything, his, his birth, uh, his crucifixion, his miracles, his teachings, his resurrection, his ascension into heaven, and even his second coming we commemorate, even though for us it hasn't happened yet. The, the, we also, during the Anaphora, chant the hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord Sabaoth. And this, as we said last month, comes from Isaiah, the vision of God in the temple. Even though God is surrounded continually by the angels and archangels, God accepts our humble gifts of bread and wine with love. These gifts are consecrated by the Holy Spirit. And the priest uses the same words that Christ said at the mystical supper with his disciples. Take, eat, this is my body. Drink of this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. And this is the point of the service where the priest calls for the Holy Spirit to come down. We also gave thanks in the Anaphora to God for the Virgin Mary and for all the saints. And we thank God for giving them to us so that we have them as intercessors and as role models. And through them, he brings us closer to his kingdom. It's also a reminder that just as the saints offered their entire life to God and gave everything for him, so we also have to work with God. Our spirituality, our spiritual life is a synergy with God to obtain His grace and finally be rewarded at the second and just 
uh, judgment day. Finally, the priest prays for all the souls who have departed as well as for the living. So in the liturgy, in the Anaphora, we pray for all of creation, the whole world. And we offer this world back to God so that he can transform it, heal it, and unite it to him again, just as it was in the beginning when he created everything. As we move forward now, we see the tone of the liturgy shifts. It's no longer about the sacrifice. It's not about uh, making us worthy to offer the gifts. Now it's about making us worthy to receive the gifts. Because as God takes our offering, he transforms it into his own body and blood and it offers it back to us. And so from here on out until Holy Communion, we see the prayers are about us being worthy now to receive the gifts. So the priest turns to bless the people and says, The mercies of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ be with all of you. We ourselves are not worthy to receive the gifts. Who can be worthy? Who is worthy? Who can honestly claim to be worthy to receive God's body and blood? None of us. But through God's mercies, which the priest is now granting to us through his authority as a clergy, he makes us worthy. He justifies us. The next set of petitions that follow are called the litany of asking. That's because in the full set, we say, let us ask of the Lord many times. These petitions were originally intended only for the conclusion of Vespers and Orthros. So for those specific services. So the question we ask is, how did they end up here in the middle of the liturgy, right before Holy Communion? One of the theories, yes, there are liturgical theories on, uh, or, on the Orthodox liturgy, is that uh, at this time of the service, if you were not receiving Holy Communion, you would leave, you would depart. Not because of any imposed necessity to leave, but because really the only thing left to do at that point was to receive communion. So if you were not receiving communion, there was not really a reason for you to stay. And imagine in Hagia Sophia and Constantinople, we're talking thousands of people would have received communion back then. So you would have waited a long time to not receive communion anyway. So the theory is that people would leave uh, at these times. And so these petitions were added here almost as a dismissal for these for the non-communicants, as a dismissal for the people who are getting ready to leave and go home. Uh, they're in a way, the church praying for them as they leave into the world, for God to protect them and to keep them safe as they go back into their, their everyday lives, so to speak. Uh, in most churches nowadays, this set of petition is shortened, as we do here, to only four petitions. And those are, having commemorated all the saints, again and again in peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the precious gifts you presented and consecrated, let us pray to the Lord, that our God who loves mankind, having accepted them at his holy and heavenly and mystical altar, as an offering of spiritual fragrance, may in return send down upon us the divine grace and the gift of the Holy Spirit, let us pray. And then finally, having asked for the unity of the faith and the communion of the Holy Spirit, let us commend ourselves and one another and our whole life to Christ our God. So this is the litany of asking as we typically do it nowadays. And I want to take a minute to highlight this last petition. Having asked for the unity of the faith. What does this mean? Having asked for the unity of the faith. First, it's important that as a Christian community, as the church, which God himself came down to establish, that they are, there be unity among us. That we be a united community. In the teachings of the apostles, there's, a, there's an old text from the first or second century, the teachings of the apostles. They state, the apostles state, that if there are two brethren or more brethren who are fighting with each other, if there's an offense or a disagreement, they should not even be allowed to enter into the church until they have reconciled with each other. And so uh, this was how they ran their church in the early days. If there was, if there were, was infighting, if there was dissension, those people were not to even enter into the church because they felt that it was defiling the offering and the sacrifice that was taking place. St. Maximus the Confessor, he writes that the church is an image of God himself. And our God is a God of complete unity and love. And so we, as the church, as the body of Christ, have to reflect that. How can we be a reflection of God if we're constantly fighting with each other and at each other's throats? So the first thing uh, is that we are praying for our own unity amongst each other. But the unity is not only social. Uh, it's not just a can't we all just get along kind of unity. It's not what we're talking about. It's a unity of faith, as it says in the petition. And what does this mean? It means that in order to be admitted 
to the holy mysteries, our faith, our personal faith, must align itself with the teachings of the church. People of other faiths, or even Orthodox people, who believe and teach false things, we call them heretics typically, should not approach the chalice. In the words of St. Cyril of Alexandria, we will not become sharers, this is in your sheet by the way, we will not become sharers in the holy and life-giving sacrifice with those who believe in doctrines other than those that are right and true, but with our brethren and those of one mind, with whom there is unity of spirit and identity of faith. So there was a, our brotherhood and sisterhood, our family here at Panagias, is centered on our faith in Christ, our Orthodox faith. So we can't, as Orthodox Christians, make up our own ideas or adopt our own assumptions uh, as the teachings of the church. And many times as priests, I get very frustrated when I hear people say, well, the church teaches this and this, and I'm like, I don't know where you got that from, because that's not, you know, maybe it was something they learned when they were young, and it was a mistake. So, but we have to be ready to deepen our faith, learn about our faith, and align our faith with the teachings of the church. And our faith and the doctrine that our church preaches came from somewhere and for a reason. Where did it come from? It came from God himself, who came and formed our church with, through, his, through his blood and through his death and resurrection. And why did he do it? For our salvation. And so we have to protect that faith and that unity of faith amongst ourselves at all times. And this is why we pray to God to preserve our unity of faith at this time. It's in this unity that we approach the chalice. At this time, the priest offers the prayer before the Lord's Prayer. And really, with the Lord's Prayer, it forms one kind of continuous prayer. And this is all for our preparation to receive Holy Communion, as we said. Now we're preparing ourselves to receive the gifts. It's the prayer is, We entrust you, loving Master, our whole life and hope, and we beseech, pray, and implore you. Grant us to partake of your heavenly and awesome mysteries from this sacred and spiritual table. With a, clear, with a clear conscience for the remission of sins, for forgiveness of transgressions, communion of the Holy Spirit, the inheritance of the kingdom of heaven, and boldness before you, not unto judgment or condemnation. In this prayer, we kind of see why we receive Holy Communion. We receive Holy Communion uh, for forgiveness of our sins, so that we can have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, and that one day we will be able to enter into God's heavenly kingdom for all eternity. So the prayer, this prayer continues and kind of feeds right into the Lord's Prayer. And the priest says this exclamation, Grant us, Master, with boldness and without condemnation, to dare call you the heavenly God, Father, and to say. And then we've, it's immediately following is the Lord's Prayer. So <clears throat> there's two words I really want to focus on from this prayer and these petitions. The first one is boldness, and we hear it twice. So we know it's important. Why, why is boldness important for us as we approach the chalice? Well, St. Gregory of Nyssa, who is one of the 4th century Cappadocian fathers, like St. Basil the Great, St. Gregory the Theologian, and many others, he explains that Christ renews us and makes us like the first people. In the mysteries, we become like Adam and Eve in paradise. And Adam and Eve were full of boldness towards God, delighting in his actual appearance face to face. And so this is the attitude that we have, that we're coming to meet God face to face. And in order to do that, we have to be bold. Through Christ, the division that existed previously between God and man has been erased. There's nothing between us and God. We, are, we have become through him his friends. We have become his brothers and sisters. And as we'll discuss in just a minute, we become his children. So knowing that we have such a close relationship with God, we should be bold in offering our prayers to Him. Knowing with full confidence that He's listening to us and that He's always doing what is best for us. And yet, while our relationship with God gives us boldness, we also need to have boldness on our own to even draw near to Him. Because God is described as the devouring fire to the unworthy. So... We have to be a little bold as well to even come close to him, to even uh, draw near to him and have that life-giving relationship with him as well. So boldness is very important for us in our spiritual life towards God. The second word that I feel is extremely important is father. And it seems like such a mundane term, 
father. Father, we have, you know, fathers, grandfathers. We're, it's a term we use constantly. But I particularly love this word because it shows how things changed through Christ. So flashback, open the Old Testament, to ancient Israel before the coming of Christ. What was their relationship like with God? What was Israel's relationship like with God? That relationship was the law. It was a relationship where Israel was continually turning their back on God, breaking the law. God was abandoning Israel to their enemies, their earthly enemies. Israel, in their final desperation, repenting and coming back to God, and then God rescuing them. If you look through the Old Testament, this cycle is repeated continually. The Israelites did not see themselves as God's children. Maybe they, you know, God's chosen people, definitely, but not his children. They were Abraham's children, Abraham's sons and daughters, but not God's. In fact, they would not even call God by his proper name, nor write it down fully. That's the, the reverence and the fear that they had uh, of God and, and taking even his name in vain. Christ, however, changes everything. He says, this is how you should pray. This is Christ speaking to the people. Our Father, who art in heaven. Imagine being a Jew listening to Christ. You're like, whoa, our Father. Too far, Jesus, too far. And yet, this is the reality. This is the new reality in Christ. This even caused the fathers of our church to be amazed. St. Gregory of Nyssa, again, this is in your packets as well. What a soul must he who calls God Father have? What boldness is required? There's that word, boldness, again. What sort of conscience must a person have <clears throat> that once he understands who God is, as far as this is possible, he dares to call him his own Father? And yet Christ is telling us to call his, our God Father. St. John Chrysostom also says, How exceedingly great is God's love for mankind. What words are adequate to give thanks to God who gives us so many good things? He says, examine, my beloved, the worthlessness of you and my nature. Comparing ourselves to God, what are we? We're, we're dust and ashes, that's it. Think about what we are related to, St. John says. Earth, soil, clay, bricks, and dust. For since we are made out of earth, we dissolve back into the earth after death. So after considering all of this, St. John continues, be amazed at the unfathomable, unfathomable richness of God's great goodness towards us. For you, an earthen creature, have been told to call him, the heavenly one, Father. The mortal addressing the immortal, the corruptible addressing the incorruptible, the ephemeral addressing the eternal. And this is a great gift that we should be able to call him our Father. Of course, we are not sons and daughters of God because of our nature, of our humanity, or because of anything that we've done on our own. We were, in a sense, adopted by him. Uh, as St. Paul explains to the church in Galatia, and this is St. Paul's words, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So this new relationship that we have with God, of being His children, comes with responsibilities. In the words of St. Maximus, the confessor, we should strive to stamp the characteristics of the Father, meaning God the Father, on our lives, sanctifying His name on earth, taking after Him as our Father, showing ourselves to be His children through our actions and through all that we think or do, glorifying the author of this adoption, who is by nature Son of the Father. In other words, in our growing up, children who have respectable fathers, honorable fathers, they look up to them. They want to be like them. That's how we should feel towards God. We should feel like we want to be exactly like Him because He is our Father. And we have a responsibility to be like him because he is our father. Finally, we come now to the Lord's Prayer, which we all know and love. It's the only prayer in the scriptures that Christ himself gives in his teachings. Christ prays many times in the Bible, in the Garden of Gethsemane, before the, breaking of the, uh, the feeding of the 5,000. Many times he prays. 
But this is the only one that Christ teaches to the people, saying, this is how you should pray. Uh, St. Germanos offers this commentary and explanation of the Lord's Prayer, and you can follow along in your sheet as well. He says, Our Father who art in heaven, if you want to have God as a Father, look to heaven and not to earth. Hallowed be thy name. That is, make us holy so that you may be glorified by us. Your kingdom come. That is, the second coming. For he who has a good conscience boldly desires the coming of the resurrection and judgment. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Just as it says, the angels do your will, so grant that we may do your will. Give us this day our, our daily bread. The body of Christ is the daily bread. And we pray that we may share in it blamelessly. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Because we sin even after baptism, what I do, he does unto me. And lead us not into temptation. We men are weak, St. Germanos says. Therefore, it does not behoove us to fall into temptation, but rather to pray not to be overwhelmed by temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. He does not say from evil men, for they do not wrong us, but the evil one. And there I'll point back to St. Paul, who says, we are, our enemies are not flesh and blood, but the uh, evil forces fighting us in the world. In other words, we are not each other's enemies, even those who may be evil. Rather, the evil one is our enemy. So this is the Lord's Prayer, and I offer this uh, explanation and commentary to you from St. Germanos. After the Lord's Prayer, the priest again turns and blesses the people. He says, peace be with you all. We heard today in the Gospel this passage where Christ comes after the resurrection. He reveals himself. And what does he do? He first blesses them and says, peace be with you. And it's the same peace that the priest is giving to the people through God, well, that God is giving to the people through the priest in the liturgy. St. John Chrysostom also explains how, why peace is important as we prepare to receive Holy Communion. He says, you are about to receive a king when you receive Holy Communion. And when the king enters the soul, there should be ample calm, ample stillness, profound peace in our thoughts. So this is why we pray for peace and the priest grants us that peace, or that God grants us the peace through the priest. Then the priest turns again to the altar and says, let us bow our heads unto the Lord. And this is an instruction that the priest or the deacon, if there's a deacon, gives to the people. And so at that, at that point, the, priest, the people should bow their heads. Our worship is a physical worship. We use our body to pray as well. Where we move, we do our cross, we kneel, and we bow. The people are not bowing to the priest, even though he's the one saying, bow your heads unto the Lord. But we are bowing to receive God's blessing. We bow in humility and respect to God. Because as St. Nicholas Cavasilas explains, they bow before him not simply as creatures before their Lord and Creator, but as purchased slaves to him who obtained them at the price of the blood of his Son. For he possesses us by double right, as slaves whom he has made his children. For the same precious blood both increased our slavery and brought about the divine adoption. What is, it? What is it talk, what's St. Nicholas talking about? Slavery. Are we slaves? Well, before Christ came, we were slaves to death. We were bound to death through our sins. But when Christ came, he purchased us, so to speak, with the price of his own blood. He gave his blood so that we could be his instead of death's. And in that new relationship, in that new slavery, so to speak, God frees us. He says, now you are my children. Now you are free. And so this is why we bow to him out of gratitude and respect as our Lord. Not only is, our fa is he our Father, but he's also our Lord and our King, who has re rescued us and saved us from sin and death. So this is why we bow our heads to God. So this is immediately followed by the prayer of the bowing. And this is the prayer. We give thanks to you, invisible King, who by your boundless power fashioned the universe, and in the multitude of your mercy brought all things from nothing into being. Look down from heaven, O Master, upon those who have bowed their heads before you. For they have not bowed before flesh and blood, but before you, the awesome God. Therefore, O Master, make smooth and beneficial for us all whatever lies ahead, according to the need of each. Sail with those who sail, travel with those who travel, heal the sick physician of our souls and bodies. Through the grace, compassion, and love for mankind of your only begotten Son, with whom you are blessed, together with your all-holy good and life-creating spirit, 
now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. This prayer itself is interesting because, again, it's not really referring to Holy Communion. We're not, it's not a prayer necessarily talking about pre preparing for Holy Communion. It's actually talking about departing. It's talking about sailing and traveling and leaving the church and going to, back to our homes. And Father Lawrence Farley in his book on the liturgy talks about how this prayer has similar roots to those petitions we talked about before. How at this time people would leave, if they were not receiving communion, they would leave and go return to their homes. And so this prayer, in a sense, is praying for them and for all of us um, to be able to return into the world safely and without danger, with God's protection. But he also says that this is also a useful and beautiful part of our preparation to receive Holy Communion. How can he say that when it doesn't really apply to Holy Communion? He says, ultimately, it is through Holy Communion that the faithful leave with God's blessing. We remain safe in all our journeys because in the Holy Mysteries we have met the living God, He who directs the paths of all and holds all of us in the palm of His hand. So right after this prayer uh, and the Amen, there's another prayer, the last prayer before we receive Holy Communion. And this prayer is, Hearken, O Lord Jesus Christ our God, from Your holy dwelling place. So listen to us, God, from Your holy dwelling place. You are enthroned, uh, sorry, dwelling place in the throne of the glory of your kingdom, and come to sanctify us, you who are enthroned with the Father on high, and are presently among us, invisibly here. And with your mighty hand, grant communion of your most pure body and precious blood to us and through us to all the people. So for one last time, we are asking the Lord, who is both in heaven and on earth and with us in the church, to grant us communion of his body and blood. Then the priest, he does three small prostrations in front of the altar and says, God be gracious unto me, a sinner, and have mercy three times. And then he lifts the lamb. He lifts the amno, the body of Christ. He lifts it off the tray, off the paten. And St. Germano says this is an imitation of Christ's crucifixion, of how Christ was lifted up from the earth. And the priest says, now holding the amno, let us be attentive. The holy gifts are for the holy. Whenever we hear, let us be attentive, our ears should kind of perk up because the church is telling us something very important is about to take place. And then we have the second part, which is the holy gifts are for the holy. St. Nicholas Cavasilas, again, he explains that it's like the priest is saying, here in front of you is the bread of life. Let not everyone come to receive it, but only those who are worthy, for holy things are for the holy. St. Nicholas com continues and explains, those whom the priest calls holy are not only those who have obtained perfection, but those who are striving for it, even though they have not yet obtained it. He says, nothing prevents them from being sanctified by partaking of the mysteries, and from this point on being viewed as saints. So it's not that we receive communion because we are holy. It's not us that makes receiving communion worthy or, or holy. Nobody's perfect and we all have our sins. But if we're working for that holiness, if in our spiritual lives we're fighting to be with God constantly, fighting against our sins and our passions, then even if we haven't reached that level of holiness, we are still sanctified by the communion. Again, it's not us that makes the communion holy or taints the communion. It's the communion that purifies and sanctifies us. Now, I will say there are certain situations where even baptized Orthodox Christians with right faith should not approach the chalice. Sometimes through very severe sins, uh, we cut ourselves off from the full life of the church. You know, think about sins as like a spiritual, a physical wound. Imagine like wounds. There's many different kinds of wounds. You know, you can go from a paper cut all the way to something very, very severe and life-threatening. And when we do sustain a very severe injury, a wound or an illness, it takes time and treatment for the person to recover before they are able to return to a full and active life. The church sees sinning in the same way. Certain sins are minor. Not to say that they're, not, not to say that they're okay, but certain sins are not as mortal as other sins. St. John in his letters, St. John the Evangelist, talks about mortal sins and not mortal sins. And uh, so when we have mortal sins, when we have very serious sins and very severe sins, the church sees us as wounded. The church sees us as needing treatment and care and healing. And with proper care and healing, of course, all these sins can be overcome. 
but I'm not going to go farther into that because really those discussions take place in the sacrament of confession with the father confessor. The last few minutes here. So at this point, the priest breaks the amno. So the, imagine now the bread. It's like a, almost like a cube. He takes it and he breaks it into four different quadrants, saying the Lamb of God is broken and distributed, broken but not divided, never, ever eaten yet never consumed, but sanctifying those who partake. In other words, even though the body is broken into many pieces, it is still one body. Just as our many churches, if you think about it, make up our one Orthodox church, which is the body of Christ. He takes the part that has the IC on it. If you guys remember, this, the lamb has the symbol IC, XC, Nika. He takes the IC and places it into the chalice, saying the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Then he blesses and takes the hot water from the altar boys and pours it into the chalice in the sign of the cross, saying the fervor of the Holy Spirit, Amen. And St. Nicholas Cavasilas again, our great father in the liturgy, he says that the hot water represents the Holy Spirit, which appeared to men like fire on Pentecost. So he says, even though it's not fire, it's hot. It has that characteristic of fire. And so it represents the Holy Spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. We're not saying it is the Holy Spirit, but it is representative of it. So... As we uh, progress, next month will be our, we'll be concluding next month. Uh, we'll finish our discourse. We'll talk about receiving Holy Communion, the dismissal prayers, and finally the last procession, which is our procession from the church back into our lives. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I don't want to keep, I know some parents have kids in the Sunday school. We'll dismiss now, but I can stay for a few minutes if anybody has any questions. So may God bless all of you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for staying. And Christos Anesti. <laughs> In a presbyes I came Prostin zoi me testisen, o mitrani kisas, ai.